So, good afternoon and welcome to the great debate, should the blog replace the book? This debate is taking place to mark International Open Access Week, which runs today through Sunday. During Open Access Week, we take the opportunity to raise awareness about the potential benefits of open access and to think critically about new models of scholarship, including those that encourage a free flow of information and data exchange. So what is open access to research and why should we care? A, click, a quick glance at the Right to Research website, which is organized and run by students, articulates the problem of access to research quite well. Here's what they say. Students, through paying taxes and tuition, underwrite a vast portion of research, but they are denied access to the research results unless they also pay through taxes and tuition, often very expensive subscription fees. Now, to get a taste of the scope of this problem, I encourage you to try to connect to some of our library resources off campus without authenticating through the library website. There you will see that downloading a single article will cost $36 or more. When you, when you graduate, you're completely cut off. So we're trying to raise awareness of ways that authors can publish their research where they need to, but still make their works open to the world. There are options. You'll notice that we have a Twitter fall for the event on our big screen TV, and we encourage you to participate by tweeting your thoughts on the topic with the hashtag blog versus book. At the end of the debate, we'll pick a winning tweet, and the winner will receive a $20 York University card credit. We'll have a question of the day, Monday through Friday, where a winning tweet will be awarded the $20 prize. So I encourage you all to participate all week. So also join us here on Wednesday at noon for our Isn't Open Suite event, where we'll be distributing free cupcakes in celebration of Open Access Week. But you're here for the debate, so let's get to it. We're hosting this debate today to examine the value of emerging forms of scholarly communication. It is meant to be more of a light-hearted exchange, a mock debate, if you will, where our debaters are picking a side for the sake of raising the issues and exploring the arguments. The format of the debate will start with opening statements from both sides, and then we will open up the floor for questions from you, the audience. Feel free to tweet your questions if you wish, and then the debate will conclude with rebuttals from both sides, and then it's up to us to pick a winner. I will also take this opportunity to advise you that this event, as you'll notice, is being recorded for future viewing, and it all, it's also being live streamed on the web. So we have assembled for you, and I'm really excited to introduce our expert panel for our debate. I'll start by introducing our debaters who are arguing for the blog. So Ian Milligan, is an assistant professor of history at the University of Waterloo and has a PhD from York University. He is a founding co-editor of the blog activehistory.ca and ironically, given his debating stance here, is working on a book manuscript dealing with young workers, unions, and new leftists during the 1960s in Canada. Melanie Fullick is completing a PhD in education with a focus on post-secondary governance policy and organizational change. She holds a BA in communication studies from McMaster University and an MA from ling in linguistics from York University. Melanie has written for various publications including Inside Higher Ed, The Guardian UK, University Affairs and Academic Matters and she can be found on Twitter at Kiwi and through her blog Speculative Diction. Arguing for the book and on this side, we have John Fink, who is the Digital Scholarship Librarian at McMaster University. He completed his BA in English from Miami University in 1995 and his MLS from San Jose State University in 2005. His research interests include copyright, open source software, physical computing, version control, and the digital humanities. And finally, we have Scott McLaren, who completed his PhD in book history and print culture at the University of Toronto in 2010. He is humanities librarian and a faculty member in the graduate program in humanities at York University. 
This year, Scott was awarded a Bodian Fellowship in Book History by the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester, Massachusetts. His research has appeared in a variety of scholarly journals, including the papers of the Bibliographical Society in Canada, Renaissance, and Christianity and Literature. And now for our debate. The resolution for our debate today is, be it resolved that the blog should replace the book. I invite our first speaker, Melanie Fullick, in support of the resolution to come to the podium and make her opening statement. She will then be followed by Scott McLaren. Hello. It's gonna get my little timer going. Okay. So the main points that we want to make about the blog today relate to, the main points that we want to make about the blog today relate to accessibility because that's the theme of open access week. So the first thing we want to say is that books and the current publishing system inhibit the dissemination and free flow of ideas which prevents more innovation and more knowledge from circulating. Um, books take a lot longer than blogs, for example, to be published, so speed is a big issue. Um, so books can take two, three, or even four years to become published. Um, and uh, another pro point problem with books is that uh, it's scholarly publishing. Um, books generally can't contain more than 20 to 25 percent uh, previously published material, so it means that even if you have new material, you have to hold it back and not share it with people, otherwise you can't put it in your book. Um, another great point about the, the, the speed of blogs is that you can respond quickly to current events. So if something happens that relates to your research area, you can just respond like that and write a blog post and you can become a part of that public debate immediately. Um, another point about blogs is the flexibility um, with uh, the, the, the length of the blog and the content of the blog and also the timing right, is much more flexible than with published books. Um, so the, 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 a book generally has to follow a certain length format, whereas a blog certainly doesn't. You can write 100 words, you can write 1,000 words, whatever you want, uh, until you're done with your point. Um, okay. Another point I want to make is about readership and reach, which is another accessibility issue. So blogs can basically reach a larger and more diverse audience. Um, so scholarly publishing in, in Canada and elsewhere actually is a niche market. Um, you might have a run of 500 books uh, distributed to certain subscribers, but you're not going to get a broad audience that way. On the other hand, blogs can get tons of readers from anywhere. Anyone who can access the internet, as long as your blog is open, can access what you've written. Um, so active history that Ian uh, helps with gets about 12,000 unique visitors per month. Uh, my blog, uh, Speculative Diction, just had about 3,000 unique visitors in the past month. Um, whereas if I had written a book, um, I'm not actually sure how many you know, readers there would be. And also, even an academic article um, takes a long time and you have no idea how many readers you're going to have. There's no way to track it. Um, so you're going to get more readers because of that accessibility. Blogs are free to access um, as opposed to books which can cost $50 or more. Uh, and you know may not be available anywhere except on a website and th then you have shipping costs too. Um, the last point I want to make is that scholarly publishing as a model uh, is actually in need of a serious overhaul um, and all these points that we've been making about scholarly books and um, journals actually contribute to this. Um, a lot of people talk about how peer review is required for us to have quality scholarly materials um, but we would argue that peer review, even with anonymous peer review, um, is not necessarily any better than other models because it's not necessarily even anonymous. Um, since you know, people can look up uh, your subject, they can, and a lot of people know each other, um, and a lot of people get published through these networks of people um, rather than uh, through um, actually uh, writing just you know, purely great content, right? Um, we have another point. Um, if, you're, if your blog post is crap, you'll get immediate feedback, which is really nice. So there's immediate feedback. Um, now, some people are afraid of that, but we think it's a good thing. Um, and also, um, new, the, we already have new uh, blog models that are beginning to be used, where we have um, uh, editing by collectives, like peer, kind of a peer editing, a peer review by collectives. 
um, or, or curation of the best of blogs and this kind of thing. Um, but this is the last point. <laughs> Professionalization is an issue. Um, <coughs> blogs are not just inaccessible for readers. Um, they're also, uh, books, sorry, are not just inaccessible for readers, they're actually inaccessible for, for writers, for early career scholars like me and Ian, who are trying to get into academia. Um, because it's a lot harder to write a book, to sit down and write a book and have the whole thing approved and published, and of course that process takes years. Um, and so with a blog, we can just kind of put ourselves out there and bring attention to our research without having to go through um, all, th all these hurdles and things that we might not be able to get past otherwise. Um, I know personally there are a lot of people reading my blog who would never have any kind of uh, access to any of my research uh, at the moment since I'm a PhD student and uh, so that wouldn't be happening um, unless I was publishing academic papers and those have their own problems. Um, and uh, we also, the last thing is that blogs can help us create a conversation and create a network of scholars in a way that's a lot more accessible for um, young academics um, and it's more inclusive as well so you have more people participating um, again a lot of people think it's a little bit frightening to have people who from outside the academic world to be able to see what we do read what we do but I think that's something that has to happen with the university we need to break down these boundaries uh, and start inviting other people in to see what we actually do um, so the blog is more like a, a part of an ongoing dialogue um, that's really open and we can allow uh, more people to start participating. And we think that it would be a great development in academic publishing and scholarship if this was something that more people were using. Thank you. Speaking on behalf of the book, is that loud enough? Everyone has a favorite book. Maybe your favorite book is James and the Giant Peach. Or maybe it's the Cat in the Hat. Or maybe it's the Hobbit. The fact is, we all get the warm and fuzzies when we think about our books from childhood. Now we're in the more esoteric, rarefied environment of the university. Maybe we have different favorites. Maybe now we like Charles Taylor's A Secular Age or something by Foucault. Something at least that we can put on our shelves and impress our friends. That's what we're looking for. Robert Darnton begins a recent essay on the future of libraries by recounting a story that was published in the 1770s by a French writer by the name of Louis Mercier. Mercier was a futurist, and he imagined in his story, written in the 1770s, that he fell asleep, and he didn't wake up for about 700 years. When he woke up in the year 2440, he ran off, being a child of the Enlightenment, to see what was in the National Library. What were the hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of books that had been written since he had fallen asleep? And when he arrived there, he was surprised to find that, in fact, there was only a modest room. And in that modest room were four small bookcases. So he asked the librarian, what happened to all the thousands of books that were here even in the 18th century? And the librarian responded that they had all been burned. Burned? Yes, we had a panel of scholars go through them and those scholars eliminated all the falsehoods. And then they boiled the rest down to their essence. And here we are, four bookshelves of books. And I think we can all agree that that would be a dystopian view of the future. But nostalgia, however powerful a force it may be, is not going to be enough to ensure the book's survival. So what I'd like to do is just very briefly talk about two things. If I can just wake up my iPad again. Two things that I think may, um, may ensure the book's future. Uh, whether or not you will agree with me uh, largely depends on how you define the book. And hopefully when you hear me discuss these two aspects, you'll get some sense of how I define it. So I'd like to talk about the book as a container and the book as a commodity. Books have a beginning, a middle, and an ending. 
That is, books present the writer with a circumscribed, confined space in which to produce some kind of an arc. If you're writing a work of fiction, then it's a narrative arc. If you're writing a scholarly book, then it's a sustained argument. When the book is finished, the text in it is stable. It's complete, and it's something that readers can master. This is very important uh, for scholarship, that you achieve a mastery of certain texts. Blogs, on the other hand, go on and on and on, possibly forever. And they are difficult to master because they are never done. And this is a great problem, I think, for a scholarly text, a scholarly text that's never done. And if I can say as an aside, there's something vaguely almost Orwellian, even sinister, about a text that's never stable, that's never fixed, and that is therefore never fully accountable. And that leads me to the next point I wanted to make, which is the book as a commodity. Now, this takes me very dangerously close to using the C word. And I realize that this is open access week and I do feel a little bit like the Grinch, but I am going to speak in defense of copyright. Now, what would the world look like if there was no copyright? Well, my friends on this side would have you believe that the world would be a perfect place. We could have access to everything that we wanted whenever we wanted, a pure utopia. But in fact, we don't have to imagine what the world would be like without copyright. All we have to do is look back in history because we haven't always had copyright. The first copyright law was introduced in 1710. It was called the Statute of Anne. Now, before the copyright law, there was printing with movable type, but there were lots of things that we didn't have before the introduction of copyright law. What happened in the 18th century? We had the rise of the novel. We had the emergence of the professional writer. We had the rise of the periodical press, the appearance of the newspaper, and most importantly, I think, we had the rise of parliamentary reporting, which came along with the emergence of professional writers. And that meant that for the first time, we were holding politicians to public account in a public sphere. You might argue that without copyright law, none of these things would have happened. There would have been no Anne Radcliffe, no Samuel Johnson, no Daniel Defoe, no Samuel Richardson, and all that followed. So I would like to submit to you that in fact copyright, if we look at the argument that history presents us with, is in fact a good thing for readers, writers, publishers, and society at large. It allows us to protect our intellectual property. A book is a wonderful container in which we can put those ideas forward, they can be protected by the law, and then those ideas uh, can be debated in a public sphere. All of these things, I would argue, if we have to have day jobs or rich patrons to support our work, as did medieval writers and many early modern writers, uh, would not be possible. Now, in closing, I'd just like to say that in the 18th century, when the periodical press was rising, there were many people who felt the book would die. Why would I read 500 pages in a book when I could read a distilled article in only 20 available through my favorite quarterly or monthly periodical? The blog is the 21st century answer to the 18th century periodical. What happened in the 18th century was that periodicals actually increased the demand for books because periodicals were used to advertise books, to review books, and to promote books. What are we seeing today? Blogs are being used in the same fashion. Blogs advertise books, blogs review books. In fact, books are published uh, with accompanying blogs, and uh, John Dupuy, the science librarian, just mentioned to me before this debate that some blogs are even being published in book form, where you'll take the, you know, the, the best examples, the best postings from a blog, and you'll condense them down and publish them as a print book. So I think, in fact, what we have here is a bit of a false dichotomy. Instead of uh, two diverging forms, we have two forms that are, in fact, mutually reinforcing. So I would like to suggest to you that, in fact, the book and the blog both have a very bright future. Thank you.
So thank you very much, Melanie, and thank you, Scott, for those opening statements. Um, at this point, we'd like to invite audience questions or audience comments um, that would trigger a potential response from either side, from our, from our panelists. Does anyone have anything that they'd like to ask the panelists? And just raise your hand and I'll, I can come to you. Okay, great. Um, so my question for both sides is, would you care to differentiate between entertainment in the blog and the book, as in novels and reference or research works? Oh, you could talk to you. Oh, I can talk to you. Ah, right. Um, I think there is a, that's a very good question, thank you for that. I think there is a distinction to be made between uh, works for entertainment and scholarly works and I think it's much easier in fact to justify uh, open access in academic contexts than it is in some other contexts where writers are, are writing uh, to put food on the table. Um, academics like uh, William Shakespeare had a day job. Uh, academics have day jobs and so they can afford to produce this research um, and publish it and make it freely available. Um, where that leaves the publisher, I'm not exactly sure. That's a trickier question. And do we have a reply from the blog side? Yeah, well, we're trying to think of a reply. I mean, differentiate between entertainment and research in terms of copyright? Is that what you mean? No, I guess it's, um, it's a question of functionality is, is okay. really what I'm interested in. I mean, okay. I, I just, my personal opinion is the blog seems more like entertainment. And okay. Okay, so. Yeah, okay. I, I think it depends on the field. I know myself as I work in the digital humanities, digital history. And blogs are our prime method of sharing information because there are areas to share small snippets of code, there are areas to share small insights, to share methodological reflections, and let you try out activity before committing it to any other form. That you can have this dialogue with leading scholars in your field um, and try out ideas that aren't warranting a 10,000 page treatment, that are warranting a 700 word area. So yeah, there's entertaining blogs, but I think there's also very serious technical focused blogs that help sort of carry the scholarly conversation on every hour, every day, every month, in between those major deliveries of research activity. Does anybody else have any questions? Can I add something to that? Oh, I definitely. Just say, I mean, I, I've, I've never thought of my blog as entertaining. I'm sure people do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I certainly do not write it with the intent to, to, to be entertainment. It's written to be um, critical analysis of the research, of the kind of issues that I deal with in my research, if that's an answer. Not meant to be entertainment. What about the blog as a notion of a container for prestige? So, if we were to examine, you know, the book has that that finality to it. It's a container has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a blog continues. Um, could you comment on how that how that structure might impede or might pr create challenges for? scholars to evaluate? Um, I would just say I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, uh, it is a challenge. It's a big challenge. And it, but the, thing, the interesting thing is you can see that whatever old academic publishing models we've been working with for a long time, like you can, I, I see it personally in the academic model, right, because that's the one that I'm around the most. Um, there's a problem with prestige because it's a currency in academic life, right? And so how you generate prestige in order to get yourself an academic career is a huge issue that everybody is fighting over. And, and these kinds of technologies are disrupting that quite a bit. I hate to use the word disruption. It's very, you know, the word right now. Um, but th this, is, this is an issue that is kind of being fought out in public in a way. Um, like that recently there was a big debate about whether people could live tweet conferences and it raised all these issues, like how are you generating prestige? Are you generating it with just within the conference room with your peers who are sanctioned? 
or are you generating it with a larger audience that those peers don't have access to? So I think it's open. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, speaking of peer review, what do you think of the idea that maybe blog comments are kind of a post-publication peer review that could replace the kind of traditional uh, pre-publication peer review that, say, academic monographs would have? That's kind of a difficult, thorny question, as anyone who has read YouTube comments uh, can attest to. And I don't think it's such a clear-cut issue to say, okay, peer review, by which we mean blind peer review by people in the same profession, can be functionally equivalent to unvetted blog post comments, which I love. I just don't think they're in the same classification. And I'm not sure how that classification will blur with time or not, but they're certainly not right now at the same level. Sure. Um, blog comments do not equal peer review as a straight equivalency, but they can be part of a broader network of evaluating this kind of scholarship or evaluating these ideas. Comments matter, and they can be very constructive and help you develop your idea. Peer review can be constructive, but not always as well. But in addition to just blog comments, you can get a sense of how an idea is being received by the public conversation around it on Twitter, by the public conversation around it on other blogs, and even as crass as it sounds through some degree of metrics, are people reading it? Are they engaging with it? Are they staying on the site? You can actually track the degree to which people are receiving it. And if they hate it, they'll tell you. And if they love it, maybe you'll see it cited somewhere. Maybe you'll see it advance a scholarly, com scholarly conversation more than a traditional peer-reviewed article might or a traditional print monograph. Thank you. I think we have time for one more. Um, to maybe, maybe two. Let's um, if the blog was to replace the book, what would happen to the publishing industry? What would happen to the publishing industry? I, I think this, um, thinking off the top of my head, like this whole day is, um, the publishing world will have to face a readjustment. That, I think, there will be a place for some monographs, that the top-notch monographs, but as a standard currency of scholarly dissemination, presses are going to have to rethink themselves. And I think they're going to have to anyways, as the climate in Canada changes with funding and so forth. But increasingly, publishers are adapting. Athabasca University Press, which is like my favorite press right now, is all open access, is really responsive to online publishing these new models. And hopefully, if we look to them for some inspiration, we can see publishers grow with blogs, adapt with blogs, that it doesn't have to be blog v book. Okay, one more question and I'll come over to you. Yeah. I think that, that lady had it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But thanks. No worries. There you go. Um, do you see a time when universities will, ex sorry, would potentially be accepting uh, so-called blog publication as part of promotion and tenure? And what role does the academic community have to play in this transition, I guess? Thanks. Um, well, uh, if I can just respond to that quickly, I think TNP is, uh, it, peer review has always been the gold standard for TNP. And so I think, um, I think even now, though, blogs would not be completely ignored in the process. Um, but I, I don't think, I mean, going back to the question about comments being written on blogs, the comments are only as good as the readers uh, who are making them. And the whole idea with peer review is that you're being reviewed by peers and uh, people who already have expertise in the field. Um, the problem with the blog, of course, is that there's no real quality control with it. And so um, uh, putting it in a TNP file uh, it's published, it's out there, but it hasn't gone through that sort of rigorous review. So I think a TNP committee would almost have to engage in that kind of review of the blog if they were going to put it on that level. Do you want to go first? Or? Yeah, um, I, think I, I agree with this issue, although I, 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 I would debate that there's no quality control, actually, um, but that's a slightly different issue. But there are already, um, there are already universities in Canada that are beginning to take into account this kind of stuff, just, just to make that point. 
Um, now, it, I think the cases are mostly sort of exceptional right now. Like if the, the, the profs who have done a lot of work, who have really uh, worked with, and, and working in certain areas, it's more likely to be acceptable. Um, but certainly there's some profs I know from UBC who have already used social media um, uh, content as part of their tenure and promotions dossier. <coughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm currently at the University of Waterloo, which has a fairly progressive tenure and promotions policy. Um, so now when I blog, I'm like, I'm getting paid to do this. But so the difference is with peer-reviewed articles and peer-reviewed books, it's sort of taken as a given. We know what that is. It's a known quantity. Whereas with blog posts, we have to substantiate providing metrics, providing impact of discussion of the conversations, et cetera, to back that up. But certainly, I think universities are more and more open to scholarly dissemination, as long as it's serious. And there does have to be some check on it to make sure it's rigorous, just like peer review filled. But I think we're going to slowly see a move towards that. All right, I want to thank everyone for their questions. Um, at this point, we need to move on. So we've heard our debaters' opening statements. We've heard some of the arguments. And at this point, I'd like to invite our debaters to come to the podium and provide us with their rebuttals and their closing statements. So we'll start with Ian Milligan, and then John Fink will have the final word. Thank you very much. Well, as an academic, I normally like to prepare everything I do, so this is a bit off the cuff. But when Scott mentioned Cat in the Hat was his favorite book, I thought of about every blog in the world that I like to follow that is literally cats in hats. <laughs> and it sounds funny, but I actually think that is just as valid as Cat in the Hat, that it's filling a different function, and it never ends, and that's part of the charm of it. So in my brief rebuttal, I want to advance the idea that blogs and books, I agree, do have a future. But it's not as harmonious as Scott would suggest in this scholarly context. And I think in the spirit of Open Access Week, it's worth reinforcing that. So when Scott said blogs go on and on and on and on, that they're never done, compared to a scholarly text that's containerized that has a discrete argumentative flow, a beginning, middle, and end, the idea of a blog never being fixed doesn't have to be an inherent characteristic. We can preserve blogs. We have functions, um, Melanie mentioned models like Press Forward under George Mason that are selecting blog posts, trying to give it additional credibility, trying to select them as they exist at the given time. And that idea of developing, the idea that books today are different than what they were, and blogs today are not equivalent to the milieu of the 17th century. I cribbed this from Melody. She wrote on her page, we did not stick to scriptatoriums when the print shop was invented, that we have to keep evolving. That I agree, without copyright, what we saw in the 18th century wouldn't, in 19th century wouldn't have happened, this explosion of scholarly activity. So it was a good thing then. But now, open access here at York University, copyright I don't think is that important because I'm paid to research anyways. I'm paid to disseminate my information, and I'm privileged to do that. We have tons of people who aren't paid for the research, and copyright might have a role for them, and that's a broader problem of a broken academic model. But the idea that without copyright, I'd need to find a patron, we already have a patron here. It's the government of Canada, it's the students' tuitions, et cetera, et cetera. And Scott's idea advanced that blogs can complement books. That might be true when it comes to Penguin. I don't think it's always true when it comes to scholarly publishing. We have to worry. If we publish more than 20 to 25% of that scholarly book on a blog, we might run into problems with the federal government saying that we've published too much beforehand, that it's out there. And in that way, the blog becomes a barrier to getting our ideas out there in book format. And we can actually be timely, as um, Melanie said, and more responsive. And the flexibility of a blog is a good thing. That idea that it doesn't have a beginning, that it doesn't have an end. To re-emphasize, it means that you can have different lengths. If you have an idea that warrants 500 words, the blog is perfect. If you have an idea that warrants 10,000 words, the blog is perfect or a series of blogs is perfect. 
tablet technology is advancing, computer screens are getting better. That idea that print has an inherent readability improvement over uh, electronic text isn't necessarily true now, and I don't think it's going to be true at all in five years. So to summarize our argument, this is part of Open Access Week. Open Access Week is about the free flow of information and the free flow of data. And if we really care about access to research, blogs are the way forward. And they're the way forward to re-emphasize because blogs make it easier to disseminate our information. They're quicker. You don't have to wait seven years for your idea to appear in print. You can do it today. And it can be rigorous, as we discussed. You can deal with current events in a way that the University of Toronto Press can't. As I said, they're more flexible. You can have a bigger readership and reach. Re-emphasize those numbers. Active history, we get 12,000 individual viewers a month, 35,000 page views. Melanie's blog gets 3,000 unique viewers and 9,000 views. And that's just her column alone. Like, incredible metrics. It's more accessible because it's free. It's not $70 for that hardcover book. It facilitates networks. It facilitates more feedback. It facilitates a collective of scholars working together. And it's more equitable for young academics. It's more equitable for people who want to get their ideas out. There's lower barriers, and I think that's a good thing. So I want to thank you very much, and I look forward to John's response as well. Thanks. All right. Um, this morning when I got up, and my wife said, where are you going? Even though I told her already. She said, uh, I said, well, I'm going to debate. And she said, oh, yes, the one you're going to lose. <laughs> and I said, oh, thank you very much for your vote of confidence. And really, in kind of a way, I'm glad that it, the, the, the topic is, should the blog replace the book and not would the blog or will the blog replace the book? Because I don't think I could argue very convincingly uh, with the latter. I can't really make an emotional argument for the book. I can't do it. Um, I'm a librarian. Uh, I grew up, you know, reading books. I grew up doing all this stuff, but I can't bring myself to defend the book based on its physicality, on its, uh, on its uh, nostalgic value. I'm a technologist. Uh, I probably have fewer books in my house than probably all these people, uh, really. I I've been actually actively getting rid of them. Uh, but I want to talk about technological factors and technological obsolescence. And I do a lot of thinking about technological obsolescence because uh, I have a friend who really thought HD DVDs were going to be awesome and so he bought a whole stack of them and then you nobody know, made HD DVDs anymore. And this kind of thing happens over and over again in history. This kind of uh, issue that, okay, here's a new technology, therefore we can completely take out all the other technologies that have come before. And we've seen this happen in our own lives. We've seen it previously. Um, when radio, everyone's listening to radio, right? Okay, radio, radio. And television came out, they thought, okay, the death of radio. Why is someone going to listen to radio when we have a television that has pictures and sound? And we know people still have radio. Um, it happens, it does happen sometimes, though, because telegraph wires, I can't think of any advantage the telegraph has over radio in communicating. And so I like to think that a technology will only be replaced when it is completely every factor is an improvement. And I don't feel that's the case with the blog uh, over the book at this point. Um, a case where it did happen, telegraph radio, I used to have a TV remote as a kid that made sounds instead of light. That No one has those anymore. Um, but if you have, how many people have like Kindles? All right, does anyone have a Kindle? Okay, do you, does anyone have like a Kobo or use iBooks or anything like that? Those things are not cross compatible. If you buy a book for your Kindle, you cannot use it in iBooks, uh, except I guess with a Kindle app or whatever. And the fact is that books as they stand now have a technological component which is very equalizing. You can make an argument, a very convincing argument, that literacy is a big hurdle. But once you have literacy in the English language or whatever language, the books in that language are accessible to you. You don't have to worry about uh, not being able to read them because you don't have the right type of e-reader. And that's a very convincing argument, a very compelling argument for me because I don't have a Kindle and other things like that. 
Um, there's another quality a factor about digital rights management. And I can't remember who mentioned Orwell. Maybe everybody mentioned Orwell. Anyway, uh, I'm really, really fond of Orwell. I don't like much like his fiction, but I do like his nonfiction. But uh, there was an event that happened shortly after the Kindle came out. Uh, they were selling 1984 on the Kindle, and then they realized they didn't have the rights to sell it. Does everyone know, does everyone know the story? And so it got wiped from people's Kindles remotely, right? And so there's a big argument to make for you know, an immutability of text. Uh, Melanie brings up a lot of factors uh, which I have a hard time arguing about. Uh, shipping costs are always a factor with giving, you know, giving stuff out. Flexibility, uh, contained uh, certain length formats. I actually don't agree with the length format. People have been making pamphlets for ages and things like that. Um, <laughs> but uh, let's see. Uh, there's an availability issue and a mutability issue, as I mentioned before. Uh, the availability, uh, we tend to think as people living in a relatively industrialized Western country, uh, I live in Hamilton, that's very industrialized, that uh, everyone has access to the internet, everyone has access to all this stuff, and it's not true. I am a, a fairly frequent patron of the Hamilton Public Library, which I really quite like, and it's packed all the time, and it's not all people playing games, it's not all people uh, going on the internet. The fact is that some people do not have access to the internet. Some people cannot get these things for various socioeconomic reasons, whereas books are much easier to get. And as self-contained, they're certainly uh, immune to uh, problems with electricity and charging and batteries and all that. My phone is three years old. It lasts like maybe five minutes on a battery. Um, as a librarian, I'm not I'm not really concerned with preserving knowledge in as much as I'm concerned with eliminating scarcity. And that's why it's really hard for me to make these kinds of arguments uh, because uh, you can certainly on its face talk about the blog as a great equalizer. But scarcity has many, many, many forms. Uh, scarcity of technology, scarcity of <clears throat> of, uh, of money, scarcity of other things. And books, while they fail often on the scarcity in the purely technolo technological world where scarcity is not as much of an issue, when you bring books and blogs into the real world, the scarcity thing becomes really super apparent. And until and unless, and I would like to think until, uh, we develop replicator technology that allows anyone to print anything and make scarcity in the physical world a thing of the past as well as scarcity in the electronic world, I can't really see the book being replaced. And anyway, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've heard compelling and passionate arguments uh, from both sides. And now is our opportunity to vote on the resolution at hand, be it resolved that the blog should replace the book. So could I ask the audience that we vote by clapping for the side whose arguments have convinced you most? So I'm going to start with how many are in favor that the resolution stands, that the blog should replace the book? Could I please have the audience clap in favor of that resolution for whoever supports that? And how many of you are convinced that the blog should not replace the book? <laughs> I think regardless, we have all, both sides have won in, in, in imparting this knowledge to us. And I just wanted to thank our speakers today for so eloquently arguing their sides. I think we are all more aware of how involved this question really is. So thank you, Scott, Melanie, John, and Ian, um, very much. So could I have a hand for our panel of debaters, please? Thank you. And so at this point, um, as promised earlier on, um, we have a winning tweet to announce. And uh, uh, my colleague Nick is going to help us with that. So if I could just invite Nick to come up and announce the winning tweet for today. <laughs> so uh, I made this little buggy thing that's up over here. And Heroku 
the platform it's running on crashed in the middle of the debate. And I thought it was a stable platform. It has like 99% uptime, but not apparently now. But I did manage to snag one, and I like Snark a whole lot. Uh, so is Taha Badawi here? Uh, the presence of books is nostalgic. Is that you? All right. That's the winner. Do we, do we have to have him come up? I'd like to point out if your Heroku we'll, app was we'll a book, it's still here. <laughs> what? I said, if your Heroku app was a book, it would, it would not have crashed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Taha, can I see your, I didn't, I couldn't see you. Okay, oh, great. So um, I'll talk to you after the, after the event. Um, so we invite you to participate in the question of the day for the rest of the week. We'll be choosing a new winner each day. And we hope to see you back here Wednesday at noon for the Isn't Open Sweet event where we'll be distributing cupcakes and we'll be able to answer any of your questions about open access. So thank you everyone for attending. It was a pleasure. Thank you.